Bowman. Sit down. Guys, all right. So yesterday we talked about the agrarian revolution. He talked about an invention yesterday that changed the game for food supply in Europe, which is going to inspire a lot of innovation for the industrial revolution. All right, so there you go. There's your bell ringer for today. Jet throw tool, not the band, right? Not the pan. Okay? Yeah. So finally, how could an agricultural revolution inspire industrial innovations? There you go.
All right. So agrarian revolution, why was this so impactful? Why was it so beneficial? So we talked a little bit about some of the struggles of Europe through the Dark Ages. What was one of the biggest problems? Parker. Yeah, lack of food, right? Plain simple. So with this low supply of food, it's one of those things where it caused a lot of hardship for people because, well, they're not receiving the amount of nutrients they need. Their immune system is down. And we talked a little bit about the Black Plague already and how that rampaged all throughout Europe and killed thousands, millions of people. So it's one of those things where just a higher food supply is just going to benefit the life expectancy of people. And for this agrarian revolution, it's going to boost the population. Okay? So this is the first time really we see uh, Europe going through these changes, and a lot, of, a lot of it has to stem from the scientific revolution moving into this industrial state. Okay. Jethro Tool, what was he famed for? What did he create? Connor, go ahead. The seed drill. The seed drill, yeah, good job. The seed drill. So, how did this work? How did this work? There's many ways you can do it, right? There's one way you can kind of just push it, right? As the earth is being filled up, there's a seed within a hopper or a chamber that just drops down into the earth that you just dug up. And then behind it, right, there is kind of a spindle that pushes the dirt back on top of the seed that you just planted. So this is a faster way, a fast pace of movement. You also just pull it by with a horse or cat, right? So overall, this is a new invention that's going to really boost the uh, supply of food by planting more seeds faster and more efficient. No longer you're just down on your hands and knees, just digging a hole, throwing a seed in, cover it back up, move to the next one, right? It's uh, a lot faster, it's a lot more innovative, and this is going to inspire change. How does it inspire change? How so? Talk a little bit about this guy here. Go ahead, Paul. Because people don't have to worry about food, so they have the time on their hands to spend time. Okay, all right, yeah, good job. So as there's more of an innovation with the, let's say, agricultural sector, we have a larger food supply. Park, go ahead. Is this one more? Yeah, Awesome. Yeah, good job. Good job. So you're looking at the economic side of things, right? With a higher food supply, that drops the price. Okay, that's going to help when it comes to more innovation, when it comes to spending those resources, that funding that money on something else. Good. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. So I talked about that yesterday, right? When you have a higher food supply, you need to get that food supply to the marketplace. So this is going to only push for innovation when it comes to transportation. Right, you need to find a way to get these resources, this food, to the marketplace. Right, so again, we talked a little bit about the steam engine yesterday. It will more, we'll talk more about that today, and when we uh, and more of the first wave of the industrial revolution, and uh, where that occurred, time frame, and uh, what type of tools being used for that. But yeah, good job, good job. So again, with this agricultural revolution, this ultimately kick starts this industrial revolution. This is driving for more change, more innovation, to try to bring on a more modern society. And one thing to note with this industrial revolution, this is going to change people's lives forever. Okay, no longer are they just strict to their let's say land that they own and they're you know, they know about growing the crops that they need for their own food supply and their family. Now it's moving out towards let's say urban areas, larger cities where people are taking on jobs that at the time 14 hours a day, six days a week. Can you imagine that? Six days a week, can you imagine going to school on a Saturday? Being here for 14 hours? I think we're here for like seven, right? But man, that's a duty. Can you imagine that? Wow. All right, well, anyway, that's how things are going to change. It's going to bring on a lot more, um, really, ideas of social sciences, too, like sociology is going to be created, being thought about uh, during this time, the birthplace of it with this Industrial Revolution. Psychology, too, being expanded as we're looking at the ways of life. What's that? Pseudoscience. All right. So here are your terms for today. You'll see assembly line up here. I know that's Henry Ford. That's Henry Ford. But it's important to note, especially when we move further on with this industrial revolution, how it's important. So you got textiles and assembly line. There you go. So we might get to the textiles here today. I really want to focus on the first wave of the Industrial Revolution today and uh, kind of move from there.
All right, textiles. What do we got? What do we got? Textiles. This is going to be important, especially when you think of the South in the United States when it comes to cotton and what we know is slavery. So what do we got? What do we got? Go ahead, B. All right, good, good. So there's going to be a lot of inventions that are going to be creating uh, different types of fabric, different types of clothing, uh, and it's going to be at a faster pace. So no longer do you just have women kind of just threading the needle, creating these clothing uh, you know, after it takes a lot of labor, a lot of time. And now you have a spinning jenny, spinning mule. Jeez, that is water power, which we're going to talk a little bit more about today with these textile factories. So hydro-powered textile factories that are being pumping out different types of clothing and different types of textiles uh, for, let's say, Great Britain, Great Britain special. Right? And like I mentioned, for this textile company, this business is going to be really dependent on a lot of production of cotton. So we all know in the South, right, we're about to learn a lot more about it next year with the Civil War. And one of the biggest uh, concerns with North and the South here is slavery. And as the textile companies are emerging and becoming stronger and bigger, it's one of those things where they were needing of more cotton. And with the cotton gin, which we'll talk a little bit about more today or tomorrow, okay, this is going to enhance the need. Okay, this is going to look for the need more of slavery and demand more. So it's going to put the United States in a sticky situation. So we'll talk more about that here, probably more. Assembly line, we got assembly line. Chris, go ahead. A line where new parts of the box are added to the product. All right, good job, good job. So, okay, Henry Ford creation, right? And how he was pumping out these Model Ts, these cars, and uh, this is going to change the game for the industrial age forever, right? And this can be applied to many different businesses, corporations, not just for creating a car. But at the time, this was groundbreaking. This was something new. And each person would have a specific job as the product would roll down the line. Okay, like someone would, let's say, play, put on the uh, wheels of the car. Someone else would put something... Now let's say the doors on the car, the windows, you name it, as it moved down the line. And after it was finished, down the assembly line, it was completed, it was done. So again, it's not just applied to cars, but applied to many different things. And for Henry Ford, which we'll talk a little bit more about him, I know he's an American inventor here, but uh, he's going to change the game when it comes to I don't know, the, the work week, the 40-hour work week, which we all know and love, right? Some people say it's too long already. Gosh, I'll tell you what. All right. Okay. We're going to move on. We're going to talk about this first wave of the Industrial Revolution today. I know we're backtracking a little bit, but we talked about this already yesterday. Oh, yeah. The steam engine. What's up? All right. Hey, if you count wrestling, if you count going home and grading and planning for the next day, and oh, man, that's a lot. That's a lot. Oh, yeah. And you're just jumping on there. Okay. Okay. All right, anyway, so the steam engine. Okay, we talked a little bit about this yesterday. I had a term for you yesterday of James Watt. So he creates this. Shut up. I'm recording, too. I don't want to yell at a kid over the recording on YouTube. I'm going to lose subscribers or gain them. Who knows? Who knows? I might gain them. Probably. Probably. All right, hey, quiet now. Stop that. Okay, anyway, with this energy revolution, like I mentioned, with the first wave of the Industrial Revolution, what is going to be used as a source of fuel? What is it? What is it? Coal. Uh, okay, what was the source coal. of fuel? Yeah, coal. Good job, coal. So with coal, right, in Great Britain especially, there's huge pockets of coal. And uh, when it comes to mining there, it's going to be huge. And the United States as well. In the Anthracite region, very close to here, it's still part of here, obviously, in Pennsylvania, Central PA. So it's one of those things where coal is going to be the use of fuel for this age. Okay, and with this steam engine, coal is going to be used to burn to pretty much heat this, pretty much, I'd say it's almost like a pot of water, pretty much, that causes steam that pushes pistons, allows for movement, allows for force and energy to occur. And with this age, you see locomotives, trains, okay, which we'll talk more about here soon enough, and the steamboat, right? So one thing to note with the steamboat is that no longer you just have to rely on the wind, the sails. And no longer do you just have to worry about, let's say, the flow of the river. Now you can flow against the river, right? You can travel against the river as you're moving forward and travel into locations that you never could reach before. Or it was just hard to access because of, let's say, the flow of the water. So now with these steam engines, this is opening up the really realm, the idea of 
accessing new lands and new locations internally. Okay. Yeah, you have these larger cities that are focused on the harbor along the coastline, but now you can access internally through riverways and waterfronts, which the steam engine helped a lot. And this is only going to expand uh, when it comes to imperialism, when it comes to extracting resources and materials from other lands, like which we're going to talk about here soon with Africa and even what we know of the United States here, okay, and Central America, South America, Asia, you name it, all around the world. All right, so with this energy revolution, James Watt develops a new idea of what a steam engine is and how we could utilize these, uh, these, these mechanisms to enhance our way of life. So yeah, with travel, but to also expand resources and materials to marketplaces that we really couldn't access before. All right, so here's kind of what this would look like, maybe to generate a uh, textile company. Like I mentioned before, uh, these textile companies were focused on waterfronts and the water would push a wheel, which would cause uh, energy to be forced to mu move these spinning mules, which we'll talk about here soon. So these textile companies would be used with the energy of the water, literally. But also, you could use steam, right? You could use coal-powered, coal-fueled steam engines to help push a lot of the energy into these factories to allow for these finalized products to be made. So yeah, it's just expanding over time. You don't have to rely, let's say, just on the flow of water. Now you can access and utilize energy that you can dig up from the ground, like coal. All right, there's a picture of James Watt up there. Looks angry. Looks like he yells at kids over YouTube videos. All right, anyway, Britain starts the Industrial Revolution. Like I said, the first wave here occurs in Great Britain, right? Why Great Britain? What's the reason for it? That small island there in Europe, why Great Britain? Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, perfect. Good job. Good job. So the Napoleonic Wars Convention that kind of rampaged all throughout Europe. And it destroyed a lot of, let's say, what they have developed already early on in this industrial age. So, yeah, also you got to think to the population. There's a lot of civilians killed in these Napoleonic Wars. So with Great Britain, as we know they're an island, they're going to be uh, defended from these wars, these conflicts. And even in the future, we'll talk about with World War I. Uh, World War II, they do get attacked, but it's not what we see with invasions of other territories, other lands. Okay, like we see in mainland Europe. So Great Britain, make sure you guys remember it, this natural defense of the English Channel, of being an island, literally surrounded by water, is going to be their greatest defense. And that's not going to go away, even still to this day. One thing to know, too, with Great Britain, they have a very strong navy. Their navy is the strongest in the world. So this will be protecting them from many different types of attacks or different types of invasions. And uh, with that, they can prevent any type of invader from even stepping foot on the island nation. Why else? Why else? So I know I talked about it already. With the age of exploration, why else are they strong? Why else are they uh, allowing for this new industrial age to start there? Go ahead. There are a lot of resources coming into the country. Yeah. Another massive empire. Good job. Good job. Well, one of the slides here, I'm going to quote, where the sun never sets on the empire of Great Britain. And the reason for it is because they expanded all around the world. They controlled land and, ter and, and controlled territory in Asia, in Africa, in what we know of America, right? And, and modern day Canada, Central America, South America. And that's why and that's what they mean about the sun never setting on the Empire of Great Britain. It's because they controlled so much land. And with all that land, they can access resources and materials that you can't really find anywhere else. So they are really the hub for this marketplace, okay, for these, these items, these riches, these spices that you can't find anywhere else. And like I mentioned with that continental system, remember that with Napoleon, what he wanted to do to try to shut off Great Britain from the rest of Europe, okay, his goal is to try to cut them off economically. It didn't work out. The reason for it is because they have a stronghold on the marketplace. They have the access to all these resources that everybody wants. Russia, Spain, obviously they didn't want to follow this continental system too long. But eventually, with the 1800s, this will spread to the United States, to Japan even, to Germany, right? These new innovative ideas and these new inventions. Uh, one thing to note too is that many of uh, these countries like Germany, like the United States, uh, even Japan, they would send many of their uh, younger adults to Great Britain to learn, to be educated, to understand these new methods of industrialization. 
Why? So they can apply it back to their own country. And this will expand industrialization throughout these uh, other countries, throughout the world. All right, so again, we just kind of talked about this already, exploration and colonization. Great Britain, they expanded to other lands, other areas, and access resources and materials that you can't find anywhere else. And again, they had a stronghold on this economic uh, system. They had a stronghold on these materials and resources. Okay, if you wanted to, let's say, get these spices that you can only find in, let's say, the East Indies, well, chances are you'd have to go through Great Britain to control. Uh, if you want to try to travel to many of these other locations, right, to, let's say, Asia or even Africa, well, Great Britain controlled the travel routes to these areas. We'll talk about the Suez Canal here soon enough and uh, how this was a major hub, a major travel point to India, to Asia, and these European countries had to pay up if they want to access it. So they had a stronghold on transportation and even the materials and resources that were provided. Why? Because their, col uh, their colonies, their expansion during this age of exploration and what we're going to talk about here soon, this age of imperialism. They're going to control a lot of land in Africa, which is going to be really providing the capital, the wealth for Great Britain to expand, to innovate even more. Uh, I can just mention too, geography, right? They have natural harbors, okay? They are an island. They are protected from these other European countries that might cause a fit to them, cause a bit of conflict. One big thing here with Napoleon, yeah, he could conquer all of Europe with his strong land army, but Great Britain's an island. It's gonna be hard for him to, let's say, invade Great Britain. It's gonna be impossible for him to do so. So they're protected just because they're natural defenses. We get to World War One and World War Two, same thing. Okay, this is a hundred years after the Napoleonic Wars in Colombia, and uh, that's still their greatest defense. Uh, one thing too is that these, the uh, well, with Great Britain, they have a lot of river fronts, a lot of riverways, which helps with this industrial state. They can use the power of the water flow to help power their textile companies and pump out a lot of finalized goods just by the flow of the water. Also, they have abundance of coal and iron, materials and resources with that, that they have internally okay, in, in the island of Great Britain. And again, expanding outward, obviously, uh, to these other territories and lands, they can access those resources elsewhere as well. So they have a control of pretty much everything. All right, so like I mentioned here, this is a great quote, and I'd like you guys to write that down. That's something important, I think, that will really guides this age of exploration, uh, this age of imperialism, uh, industrial age, and this vast empire in which the sun never sets. And that's true. Like I said, Great Britain controlled a lot of land all throughout Africa, all throughout Asia, even in the Western Hemisphere. And it's literally what it states. It's five o'clock somewhere, right? You guys know that song? Yeah. Okay. Political stability. Britain had a strong, stable government that supported businessmen. Yeah, maybe. All right, their economic system with... Uh, obviously, we talked a little bit about this capitalism and laissez-faire economics, laissez-faire economics, and what we mentioned already with Adam Smith, the Enlightenment thinkers. I know he comes a little bit later, but this idea of the private sector taking the whole elite government out of it is going to inspire more innovation. It's going to inspire more growth within Great Britain, and uh, still prevalent today. And the powerful British Navy also protected overseas trade. So again, their navy is very, very strong at the time, strongest in the world. And uh, they have a strong control of their overseas territories. So if you have control of resources, materials, and if you have an economic system and government that allows for this innovation and growth, chances are you're gonna be in first place. And that's how Great Britain became one of the strongest countries of the time. Uh, we already mentioned it too, with the Seven Years War, winning that conflict against France, right? Also, they also they uh, obviously took a big one of the debt, but in any case, they were very successful in these early wars against France and solidifying themselves as the top dollar in Europe. All right, like I mentioned already with the private investment, uh, when it comes to these overseas expansions and extracting of resources and materials, they could do so through this private sector. It's not the government funding all of these projects or all of these expansion uh, uh, methods and plans. Okay, so they can allow the private sector to do stuff, and the government can just focus on other things, okay? And especially when it comes to building up their military, that's what they're going to do. They're going to 
and then build up their navy and allow the private sector to venture out and expand for the good of Great Britain. Even though it's the private sector, they still fall under uh, Great Britain and their expansion. So again, investing in mines, investing in railroads and transportation, not only in Great Britain, but through their overseas territories. And we'll talk here soon with these cable lines when it comes to um, the, the, the telegraph. Uh, they're going to be able to communicate with these territories all around the world with these cables that literally stretch from Great Britain all around the world. It's crazy to think about these underwater cables that they can use to communicate with their territories and their allies. It's crazy to think about, but it was true. And we'll talk about that here soon enough. All right, factors of production. So this is a way to try to understand a little bit easier. Land, labor, and capital. <laughs> so Great Britain had all three factors. Land, like I said, with natural resources, coal, rivers, harbors, internally. Again, they're protected by uh, the English Channel, protected by the waters that surround them from uh, other forces, other European countries. Labor, they have a growing population. Again, with a larger food supply, this is only going to benefit the population. We talked about the agrarian revolution already. Also, a lot of these innovations are occurring in Great Britain, again, because they are, this, this is where this first wave occurs. Their goal is to try to protect, it. their goal is to try to keep out any other outside countries, even though, you know, Germany, United States, even Japan, they're going to be sending many of their citizens there to learn to understand the new ways of this industrial age. But uh, their goal is to try to protect it and keep it to themselves. The reason for it is because if you're number one, if you're the uh, cutting edge of this innovation, you don't want to give it up. You don't want to allow these ideas to spread to other lands. But it does anyway. It does anyway. Uh, capital, funds for investment from wealthy citizens. Again, allow the private sector to do a lot of the funding when it comes to expansion. When it comes to overseas uh, mining, okay. When it comes to extracting resources from other lands, like we'll talk about here with Africa and Asia, and setting up railroad systems to try to connect uh, the internal lands to the harbors, to the waterfronts, to transport these materials a little bit easier, a little bit more effective. Again, when we get to this scramble for Africa, we'll talk about it. And like I said, that game it's kind of like risk. You roll the dice and try to claim these lands. I think you guys will find it fun. And you'll see exactly how these European countries really dominated the landscape of the continent of Africa. They cheat a lot. Oh, yeah? Um, okay, we can get through this. Two slides. Two slides. That's it. All right, so textiles, we already talked a little bit about it. Okay, so with textiles, these businesses really sprung up early on in the industrial age. And the reason for it is because of clothing, cloth, okay, and other types of fabrics used for many different things, obviously. So the need for cotton was uh, really intensified during this time, especially as you have these textile businesses running off the flow of water, these uh, mills that are using the water flow for power to generate these different types of spinning wheels okay, that help weave cloth together for clothing, blankets, or you name it. And uh, like I mentioned, eventually this is gonna push for a lot of need a lot of uh, a lot of expansion when it comes to the cotton okay, industry, and uh, especially for the United States, the southern states, they're going to be supplying this cotton for Great Britain and uh, really to expand their textile companies. So the demand of slave labor is going to be needed pretty heavily in the South uh, during these times of the industrial age. Hence, why we see the Civil War in the United States. So this textile company in business, the cotton gin, which we'll talk about here soon enough, is only going to push for more and more resources to be there. Yeah, as you have more abundance of this product, the price is going to drop. But at the same time, uh, you want to try to keep up with the demands. It's not like you're losing money, especially when cotton is, is king. Okay, so we'll talk about that here soon enough. And you can make that connection next year when you learn a little bit more with American history and the Civil War. All right, so the old ways, well, you would just pretty much have a bunch of women kind of sitting in a factory, a small place, small location. At that point, it wasn't even a factory yet because you weren't even using the different types of fuel sources, energy sources like water or even steam power, uh, coal fuel factories. They just kind of sit in their homes, made up some clothing, and then they would just give it to, let's say, the business owner. 
But eventually, once you have these energy outputs, these energy sources, like utilizing water to help power these textile companies and steam engines, you'll see a lot more innovations occurring to a point where they're going to focus a lot of these people, especially women and uh, younger children, to work these textile companies. And they're going to flow to different cities, different locations where there's going to be a larger population where these factories are going to emerge. So we'll talk about some of the negative impacts of this industrial age when it comes to overpopulation, when it comes to urbanization, when it comes to sicknesses and diseases spreading amongst uh, really all throughout these industrial cities. But this is, again, growing more, uh, growing more innovation in Great Britain. So one thing I really want to focus on is the spinning mule. We'll talk about that or tomorrow as we're finishing up here. So the spinning mule, I'll show you a video of it tomorrow at the start of class. It's utilizing the water power to generate different and, and, and helping create more types of clothing and cloth from uh, the cotton that has been uh, extracted from, especially the United States South. And uh, they're going to use this to help pump out a lot more textiles than what you could just do by hand. And these are many inventions here that are showing that uh, you can do this a lot more effective, a lot more efficient with the use of power and uh, using water, uh, power, and uh, even coal steam engines. All right, so we'll talk more about this here tomorrow. So with the textiles, 